Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay. I think you can, can everyone hear me? Good morning. Welcome to the first Friday lecture series, uh, second first Friday lecture series for this year, um, our Brazilian roots. I'd like to welcome both our in-room guests and our online guests. Uh, we've learned a great, a lot of great things during the pandemic. And one of them was that we can share this with the entire country of Fisher alumni and Fisher friends uh, through both streaming it online while having an in-person event. And what a great morning to have this event. Um, if anyone saw the news, uh, the World Health Organization um, ended the global emergency of the pandemic today. Uh, so that's a good, good So feel good about being here. But still be careful. Um, so, you know, today is is about our history, our, our Brazilian roots, um, and, you know, the, the giants um, where we stand on their shoulders uh, for the work we're all doing today at Fisher. Um, many of you in the room who um, is alumni that you've accomplished, we're all very proud of you. Um, so we're glad to be here with you today. Um, you know, there are also uh, great, great people here at Fisher today. Um, and it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce um, you know, one of those great leaders, um, our president, our seventh president of St. John Fisher University, Dr. Jerry Rubin. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be with you. I'm happy to hear that the pandemic is over, Chris. It'll give us so much more time on campus to plan for other things. But um, it's my pleasure uh, to be with you uh, today. You come to campus at a busy time of year. Today is actually the final day of the spring 2023 semester. And so our students are still taking final exams uh, today and some into tomorrow. And then the school year will conclude. Our commencement exercises are next week, uh, beginning on Wednesday. We have a ceremony for our intercollegiate athletes whose season success would cause them to miss their own commencement. So we do a ceremony uh, for them on Wednesday, and then we have a baccalaureate mass, which begins the commencement weekend activities on Friday. And today we do five ceremonies in total coming out of the pandemic. Uh, we came back with our commencement to campus. We had moved for years downtown to the Blue Cross Arena and did one ceremony with undergraduates and graduates together. Uh, today, we are back doing school-based ceremonies, and so we have five schools here at Fisher today, and each of them will have the opportunity to celebrate their own commencement in the Fieldhouse. So we're looking forward to celebrating with our students and their families their wonderful accomplishment of their graduation from Fisher. This year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of our great institution. Anniversaries give us time to celebrate, to look back. Uh, to remember, to recall milestones, certainly to look ahead and to plan for the future. And so today's presentation is going to, uh, in my portion, sort of give you an overview of where we've been and where we are today. And then I'm joined by my colleague, Nancy Greco, who's going to take a closer look at the, really the Brazilian influence on the institution in the first 40 years of our history. So I look forward to uh, sharing Nancy's presentation with you in a few minutes. Today, we describe ourselves at Fisher as a collaborative community dedicated to teaching, scholarship, and research in a student-focused educational environment. We speak of engaging individuals in lives of intellectual inquiry, professional integrity, and civic responsibility, where diversity and service to others are both valued and practiced. That is our mission. And throughout the last 75 years, we've been focused on creating a transformational educational experience for our students. That is the work we do each day and the work we plan for as we look to the future. As the planning effort for a new college began, a question that needed to be answered was, why build St. John Fisher College? The answer was provided in Father Hugh Haffey's book on the beginnings of Fisher. 
The reality at the time was that existing college facilities in the area were sufficient to care for only one boy out of every 210 finishing high school. The Bazillions were committed to providing an educational option for young men graduating not only from the Aquinas Institute, but for others in the Rochester community who were unable to access higher education at the time. Bishop James E. Carney of the Diocese of Rochester supported the Bazillions vision and our great institution was founded. The founding of St. John Fisher College represented a journey into a new world for early attendees, one that would be enriched and transformed by a college education. Born out of the community's desire to provide its young men with a traditional education in the humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and business, the goal of the new college was to create an educational environment that would enable Fisher graduates to succeed in life, and to help strengthen the fabric of the Rochester community. And indeed we have. Fisher has achieved many milestones through the years that have contributed to the strength of the institution today. The opening of Ward Hall in 1963 was home to the college's first residential students. Women joined the student body in the fall of 1971 and Levery Library opened in 1975. Graduate education began in the 1980s with the introduction of the Master of Business Administration and the Intercollegiate Athletics Program moved to NCAA Division III in 1987. Nursing came to Fisher in 1991. The School of Business and the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. School of Education were started in 2002 and 2003 respectively. The School of Arts and Sciences and the Wegman School of Pharmacy were started in 2005, and the Wegman School of Nursing was created in 2006. 2011, Fisher was reclassified by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching from a master's institution to a doctoral research university. In 2015, we received the prestigious Carnegie Classification for Community Engagement, recognizing the college's outstanding commitment to community service. And of course, in June 2022, almost a year ago, we were awarded university status by New York State and officially became St. John Fisher University on July 1st. This major accomplishment will help to grow our reputation and achieve even greater levels of success over the course of our next 75 years. The university's growing reputation has enabled us to increase in size and stature over the years, notably in enrollment. The first class of Fisher students totaled 120, with many from the Aquinas Institute and nearly all from the greater Rochester area. Our enrollment next fall will be nearly 3,700 students, 2,500 undergraduates, and 1,200 graduate students. 20% of our students will be from diverse backgrounds. Nearly 60% of our full-time undergraduate students will live with us on campus. 40% of our graduate students will be pursuing their studies fully online. Undergraduate students are now drawn from 25 states and graduate students represent 27 states. We've grown from a local institution to one that is serving students from across the nation and we're very proud to do so. We've evolved from an undergraduate commuter college in our early days to a comprehensive residential university community today and from one graduate program to 15 offerings at the master's and doctoral level. And we continue to grow and evolve each year. With next week's commencement, we will grow our alumni base to more than 34,000 graduates. Quite an accomplishment for the institution in its first 75 years. Rochester's influence on Fisher is evident in the names that grace our buildings, schools, and athletic fields and facilities and in the partners that we engage in delivering education. This great community has helped St. John Fisher University to successfully reach this point in our history. And I firmly believe when we look at the leaders among us in Rochester that proudly call Fisher their alma mater, those who serve in high profile roles, as well as the thousands of graduates who are part of the fabric of life here, we can say that St. John Fisher University has certainly been good for Rochester. 
My wife Susan and I are very proud of our own Fisher alumni, Michael and Elizabeth, both of whom have chosen to live and work here in our community and for whom Fisher provided a wonderful start in their professional lives. Rochester has always been an extraordinary place, and it is the Rochester community that supported Fisher, not only at its founding, but throughout our history as an institution. It was the business community of Rochester, the parishioners of the Rochester Catholic Diocese, and many individual Rochesterians who helped to achieve success in the fundraising drive for St. John Fisher College. Again, according to Father Haffey's book, in a period of approximately six months, the inaugural fund drive raised more than $1.2 million, the result of nearly 50,000 pledges. The success of this inaugural fund drive was only the start of accomplishments for our great institution. The support of the community and of the many donors and friends of the university has enabled the broad transformation of Fisher throughout its continuing period until the present. With the strong leadership and enthusiastic support of board leaders and through the generosity of thousands of alumni and friends of the university, we were able to succeed the Fisher Forward campaign goal of $75 million, well ahead of schedule. To date, the funds raised in the current campaign total more than $88 million. And given our success to this point and the building on the momentum of the campaign, the goal has been raised to $100 million, nearly two times the total of the prior campaign. The story of the past 75 years of St. John Fisher University is one of growth and impact. Through the goodness of so many individuals who have come together with shared focus and priority, Fisher has developed into the great institution that it is today. Our university is a center of knowledge and an example and growing resource to the world around us. The coming years provide us with the opportunity to continue to increase our commitment contributions, and collaborations in the Rochester community, even as we grow the geographic footprint of the university. Our support of and engagement with society not only enriches our lives and the lives of those we interact, it also does our part in our own way to honor the indispensable support that the Rochester community gave to Fisher at its founding and has continued to provide throughout our history. As we move through this anniversary year and beyond, we look ahead with certainty that a Fisher education provides the opportunity for students to realize their potential and actualize their dreams. We look ahead with gratitude. We are grateful to our bazillion founders for their vision and drive to create this great institution. And I'm grateful to our benefactors who have provided essential financial support for us to continue to grow and develop as an institution of higher education. Finally, we look ahead with purpose. We have much to celebrate and take pride in as we look back and much to look forward to and accomplish together as we look to the future. St. John Fisher University has a distinctiveness of purpose drawn from its origins and carried forward by past generations. That unique purpose is ours to embrace and advance today. At this time, I would ask you to join me in welcoming our university archivist and my colleague, Nancy Greco, who will present on our bazillion roots. Nancy. Thank you, Dr. Rooney. That was a nice recap for what I'm about to uh, share with everyone today. So good morning, everyone. And thanks for joining me today. My name is Nancy Greco, and I am the university archivist. So my role as an archivist is to collect, organize, preserve, interpret, and make accessible the history of Fisher. I hold dear the artifacts that have been left behind that can tell the story of our institution. Today, as we celebrate Fisher's 75th anniversary, I'd like to share a bit about our Brazilian roots. This is certainly not meant to be comprehensive in any way, but rather I'd like to introduce you to some of the Brazilians who guided Fisher in the early years. Oh, we had this problem before, didn't we? Where am I pointing? 
All right, let's try it differently. Does this, this work? No. Aha, here we go. Wonderful. Um, fine start so far. <laughs> okay. So here's an iconic photograph that many of you have un undoubtedly seen. The archive photograph collection contains many photographs of Fisher over time. Most which have no markings indicating the date or identifying the people and objects that are depicted. We have to use the evidence we see to interpret the picture. In this case, I know that the photograph had to have been taken sometime between 1959 when Piac opened, and unfortunately, it's behind. There we go. Can you see Piac there in the left hand corner? Okay. So that was 1959 when that opened. And in 1963, when Michael House, Ward Hall, and the Atlantic Center were built, you can see this vast open space where those buildings would be. Interpreting evidence is not always this easy. And sometimes the evidence doesn't paint an accurate picture. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. And here's a photograph that I use with my students because it tells a lot about the school in its early days. I ask students to interpret this photograph. What can you tell me about Fisher's early years just by looking at this photograph? Oh, <laughs> Absolutely. It wasn't all the way through 1960. 1971 is when we welcomed, welcomed our first women. Anything else you can tell me about the institution by this photograph? Coats. More formal dress. More formal dress. Yes, there was indeed yeah, yeah. Yeah. a dress code, um, which um, Father Dorsey helped the students change back in 1967. Right. There's a crucifix. And there's a crucifix, which indicates, right, we were a Christian Catholic school at the time. So by looking at this photograph, I was initially able to date it somewhere between 1951 and 1967 because of that dress code thing that I was talking about. But that's a kind of a large range, date range. Um, but I wanted to pinpoint the date more precisely. And it so happens in this case, there was an inscription on the back of the photograph. It simply said, Father Leonard Rush. So after consulting the course catalogs, I determined that Father Rush was a professor of modern languages teaching here for a very short time between 1959 and 1961. So I can pinpoint the date a little bit more clearly by using that information. The congregation of St. Basil began in Annonay, France on November 21st, 1822 on the Catholic feast day of the present presentation of Our Lady. The 10 founding members began as a loose association of secular priests willing to live in community and pool their resources to support Christian education. From their very beginning, the Basilians' primary mission was to educate Catholic men. Over time, that mission shifted a bit to focus on bringing college education to young men who otherwise may not have had the means to attend school, mainly immigrants and children of immigrants. In 1850, Bishop Armand de Charbonnel, an alumnus of Annone, was named the Archbishop of Toronto. The bishop invited the French Basilians to come to Canada to establish a school for the Irish Catholic community in Toronto, establishing the University of St. Michael, which is now a part of the University of Toronto. In 1937, the Bazilians arrived in Rochester to take over the administration of Aquinas Institute. Their charter required a 15 year waiting period before a men's college could be established in Rochester. We owe a great deal to Father Hugh Haffey, who masterminded the plan to fund the college. Father Haffey was born in Welland, Ontario, Canada in 1905 attended St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, of course, the headquarters of the Bazillions at the time. He was ordained in the Congregation of St. Basil in 1931, and he came to Rochester and taught chemistry, public speaking, and served as vice principal at Aquinas Institute for 10 years. Father Happy led the campaign and fund drive to build Aquinas Stadium. 
To raise money, he began a Christian culture lecture series that brought many notable writers, educators, scientists, and statesmen to the school to speak. Here he is at the dedication of the stadium. You can see him right there in the hat. Right. He must have been, I mean, he must have done a really good job because his next assignment was to be the executive director to establish St. John Fisher College, a new Catholic college for men. It reminded me of the saying, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> <laughs> his first order of business was to purchase land on which to build the college. In an article in the Times Union, Father Happy recalls the rainy day in August of 1947 when he inspected the 72 acres of farmland which were to become St. John Fisher College. Here's a quote from him in the newspaper. A brother priest from Aquinas Institute and I tramped every foot of that land. I just wanted to make sure it was the right spot. I stood at the corner of East Avenue and Fairport Road, looking back at the hill and said, when God made that hill, he made it for St. John Fisher College. I wanted the top of this hill, and I had in mind a passage from our Lord from St. Matthew, a city built upon a hill cannot be hid. And so the fundraising began with a meeting arranged by Bishop Kearney, the Bishop of Rochester, as a kickoff to a diocesan-wide fund drive. Although not a bazillion, Bishop Kearney would be a staunch supporter and advocate, advocate for Fisher throughout his life. Here's a view of the capacity audience at Eastman Theater on January 27th, 1948. By the way, fashion is another element that helps in dating photographs. <laughs> I absolutely love this very fine woman in the third, third row with her jaunty hat, but I'm pretty sure the gentleman behind her wasn't so fond of that. <laughs> Colonel Spellman kicked off the campaign with a $25,000 gift, which he presented at the kickoff at Eastman Theater. In the marginalia of Father Happy's manuscript describing the establishment of the college, he seemed to indicate a dislike for the Cardinal, who <laughs> tended to treat Father Happy as an errand boy during his visit to Rochester. None of that ended up in the final version of the book, of course. <laughs> the book is entitled Beginnings of St. John Fisher College, and it was published in 1977, in case anyone is interested in reading the full story. Father Happy implemented precision and a competitive spirit in conducting the campaign with chairs in parishes across the dio diocese competing for pledges. The campaign was a well-oiled machine in Father Happy's capable hands. By February 23rd, less than a month after the kickoff, the campaign goal was exceeded with a final tally for the project reaching over $1.2 million. I can't imagine having raised that amount of money over such a short period of time. That would roughly be the equivalent of about $15 million today. The groundbreaking ceremonies were held on Sunday, June the 19th in 1949. Bishop Carney presided with assistance from Father Happy. Mm -hmm. Not long after the groundbreaking though, Father Happy was moved to Catholic Central High School in Detroit and later to Houston, Texas, where he chaired the education department at the University of St. Thomas. Once again, he did a very good job. Before leaving though, Father Happy designed the college seal that we continue to use today with some modification to include our new status as a university. The seal combines elements from St. John Fisher's coat of arms, the martyr, bazillion symbols and elements from Bishop Carney's coat of arms. So surrounding the shield is the name of the college in Latin and you can see it better in the, um, uh, in the tile here, right? We have it in English here. Um, let's see, so the center panel here is the chalice, which is a symbol of the priesthood for the bazillion. On either side are the initials M and R for Maria Regina. So you can see that here and here. Okay. Uh, so Mary, Queen, Queen of Heaven. These came from Bishop Carney's coat of arms. On the lower left is the cross of St. Andrew. 
surmounted by the shell, which is a traditional symbol for immigrants. To the right is the combined image of the fish and ears of corn or wheat, fish ear, fisher. This comes from St. John Fisher, the martyr's coat of arms. And beneath the scroll is the motto of the Bazillions in Latin, teach me goodness, discipline, and knowledge. After leaving in October 1949, Father Happy did not return to Fisher in any official capacity until the dedication of Happy Hall in 1966. Here he is with his two nephews at the dedication. I'm just looking around, making sure. Okay. On one occasion, upon giving a similar presentation, someone shouted out, that's me. <laughs> I had the fine pleasure of meeting Father Happy's nephew, Hugh Rundle. Uh, the gentleman to the left of Father Happy here. Okay, he's an alum and a player on Fisher's first hockey team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hugh? Hi, Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, here's an image of Happy Hall, which stood alone before the campus center and other buildings began to surround it. The cars in the photograph are another wonderful element to help date an image and giving it that nostalgic feel. Aren't they wonderful? The cars are great. Okay. So uh, Father John Francis Murphy is then assigned to become president of the college. It is Father Murphy who oversees the construction of Kearney Hall, which is for many years the only building on campus. I have to admit that the artifacts that he left behind gave me the um, wrong impression about his personality. As I mentioned before, the evidence doesn't always paint an accurate picture. It was in a, in a presentation such as this that an alumni set me straight. This picture is the only one I could find with it, where he is even somewhat smiling. <laughs> this picture makes him out to be rather austere. He seems very unassuming and serious. This is a letter sent to him by Father McCorkle, informing him of his selection to be the president of the New Men's College in Rochester. The scribbles on the back of his assignment letter shows that he got right to work organizing his thoughts. He would be moving to Rochester in late December, 1949. Father Murphy's writings and speeches are serious and eloquent, somewhat flowery in language. I'll give you a moment to read that. The topics he spoke about revolved around morality and communism. I found nothing at all lighthearted in nature about his writings or his letters. Nonetheless, I've been told by some alum that he had a marvelous sense of humor, always smiling and telling jokes. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> None of the artifacts in the archive disclose his true <laughs> temperament and demeanor. I'm so glad I had an opportunity to speak with some alum who knew him well. The construction of the Kearney building began at once. The Bazillions were determined to start classes in the fall of 1951. This is Father O'Meara, the first dean. He, unlike many of the Toronto Bazillions, was a native of Rochester and an Aquinas graduate. Father O'Meara was responsible for developing the curriculum that led to our New York State Provisional Charter in 1951 and the Absolute Charter in 1955. Here's an image of that absolute charter from 1955. You can see some light damage to the charter here. It's now preserved in a mylar sleeve and appropriately boxed to keep it from further damage. And here's an advertisement for the college showing the course offerings and the start date. As I said, the bazillions were absolutely determined to start classes in the fall of 1951. And they did more or less. Here's a picture from the Times Union newspaper from September of 1951 and some quotes from that article. Classes started with scaffolding still in place. Father O'Meara is interviewed by a journalist on opening day. He's quoted as saying, 
we're past the crucial stage. At least we don't get wet when it rains. <laughs> An 18 year old Ted Case, a member of the pioneer class proclaims, I guess we're gonna be in the part with the windows. <laughs> As president, Father Murphy oversaw a series of very important firsts. That very first class of men was 110. There were 10 faculty members on campus and tuition was $480. The first scholarship was given, the very first Pioneer College newspaper issue came out and the very first yearbook came out as well. The official dedication, however, didn't happen until 1952 when everything was completed. Here's a photo of Joseph Myler speaking at the dedication. He was one of the first members of the Board of Advisory Regents and general man manager of Neisner stores, if anyone recalls that detail change. At that time, Fisher was governed by two boards, the Board of Trustees, which was comprised entirely of Bazillions, and the Board of Advisory Regents, who were important men selected from the Rochester community. These men were some of Fisher's first patrons. It was a beautiful day for the October dedication on October 12, 1952. Over 5,000 people turned out for the event. This photo was taken on the lawn in front of the Kearney building. Here's the same location on June 20th, 19, 2022, the day the staff, staff celebrated Fisher's transition to university status. The cornerstone was placed that day, came from St. Andrew's Cathedral in Rochester, England, which was once the Cathedral of St. John Fisher the Martyr. Father Graff spoke about him at the last Fisher Friday lecture. Here you can see Bishop Carney setting that cornerstone. Yeah. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Father Robert H. Flood, our first librarian. I certainly want, didn't, wouldn't want to paint the bazillions with a wide brush. Each of the bazillions brought their own strengths, abilities, interests, and personalities to Fisher. When speaking with alum, they all remember Father Flood as a person the students enjoyed being around. The formal yearbook photo on the left doesn't capture the man as well as the one on the right. Once again, a photograph can tell you a lot. I don't know this for a fact, but I think if Father Flood were with us today, he'd be a member of a slam poetry group for sure. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite photos in our archive collection. The library got its start in 1948 when the late Father Bernard Gathal donated 22,000 volumes. Here's a photo of the books in the attic at Carney, of Kearney as Father Flood stood, sorted, and organized them. Father Flood helped students start the Fisher literary publication called The Angle, which continues to today. And he was also a writer of plays and poetry. He published three poetry books, The Bashful Chair in 1952, A World Elsewhere, Selected Poems and Plays in 1961, and On Strange Track from 1967. Yeah. Father Peter Sheehan, on the other hand, had a passion for the arts. He graduated from the Royal Conservatory of, Mu of Music in Toronto with performance degrees in organ and drama. In Rochester, he was an ardent and honored member of the Rochester's Bach Society, serving as their executive chairman for four years. While acting as Fisher's chair of the theology department, Father Sheen contrived a way to expose Fisher's students to art by working with the Rochester Memorial Art Gallery. He would borrow paintings from the mag on a rotating basis and hang the pieces in the student lounge. Can you imagine hanging museum pieces in Ward, uh, Ward Happy today? <laughs> Eventually, Father Sheen began, began acquiring fine art pieces for a Fisher collection. Here he is with a couple of pieces by the American artist, Irvin Ammon. Uh, this is flute player and dog and mandolin. There were a few extracurriculars in the early days, including the debate team, drama club, we partner with the Nazareth women, and intramural athletics. 
uh, the Glee Club was very popular and Fisher's Choir won several awards. The first Glee Club director was Frank Palicki, one of the students from the pioneer class of 1955. This photo is from a 1954 Christmas performance. Can anyone guess what Fisher's first intercollegiate sport might have been? Oh. Oh. Ah, you guys are way ahead of me. There you go. Well, it was golf, of course. You can see Father Leo Manelli, coach of the golf team. He's our uncle. No way. Yeah. We'll chat. <laughs> <laughs> This is the day of the dedication for the chapel, which was in the Kearney building, the only building on campus at the time. Bishop Kearney said the first mass in the Kearney chapel. You can also see Father Murphy to the left of Bishop Kearney. Although I've been told by Dr. Munch today that maybe it was called something different. We'll learn more. Here you can see the white orchid ball from 1954. Oftentimes during social events, the women from Nazareth would join our fishermen. Again, the fashions are fabulous and a real live band, mm -hmm. not a DJ. Mm -hmm. And of course, the very first commencement in 1955. Here you can see Father Murphy, Bishop Carney, and Father O'Meara. Here's another photo from that very first commencement, all lined up in front of Carney, ready to process into the auditorium which was part of the two-story wing added to the Kearney building in 1954. Before leaving to serve as president of St. Thomas University in Houston, Texas, in the summer of 1958, Father Murphy announced the construction of the very next building, the chemistry building, which we know as PIAC today. It was completed in 1959. Father Charles Lavery became the second president of St. John Fisher College. He too comes to us from St. Michael's University in Toronto. He served at Fisher from 1958 until he passed away at the age of 70 in, on December 3rd of 1985. The Lavery years was, were ones of tremendous growth. He was a great champion for the college out in the community. He knew all the right people and knew how to get things done. You can see by some of these statistics, the improvements that happened over his tenure here. In this photo, we see Father Lavery flanked by two members of the Board of Advisory Regents, Otto Schultz on the right and Joseph Myler on the left. Mm -hmm. On the far left is Fisher's primary architect at that time, Louis Rossetti. The Rossetti firm of Detroit specialized in athletic facilities. He served on numerous statewide committees, including Governor Kerry's Task Force for Higher Education, the Advisory Board for New York State Financial Aid Study, Rochester Area College Consortium, the Commission on Independent Colleges, among others. And he won innumerable awards for all his service to the community. In this image, Father Lavery is at Midtown Plaza in downtown Rochester, participating in the old Newsboys Day the annual event to benefit the Ganae Foundation's Lend a Hand Fund. Let me briefly digress for an athletic moment. Here is the first time the Cardinal is used as our mascot. In the September 20th, 1960 issue of the Pioneer, we learned that the cross country team were planning to adopt the team name, the Cardinals. The college's Pioneer newspaper staff were anxious to promote this team stating, in an effort to develop a college mascot and school symbol, we seize upon the idea to overprint our first issue for the academic year. I was surprised to learn that Fisher didn't adopt a mascot for its first nine years. The Cardinal went through several iterations over the years. In 1971, the Cardinal developed a more cartoonish image with a full rounded body perched on the letter F. By 1988, the bird appeared more realistic with wings and talons extended and a full tail. The cardinal we currently use came about in 2001. Students want a logo that would appear more aggressive and menacing looking. <laughs> Notice that all cardinals over time have always faced to the right, 
I'm not sure what that signifies, but I hope to find out one day. <laughs> now back to Father Lavery. Uh, here he's pictured with fit when Fisher hosted a Frisbee competition, but golf was definitely his game. He had a golf course constructed across the road on Fisher property once he acquired the property known as the Druid Hills in 1963. Father Lavery knew all the right people and used government connections to bring aid to the college. Here he is with Congressman Frank Horton and Nelson Rockefeller. He would often be found on local media and volunteered and supported public television and radio. Father Lavery was also very active in Rochester's interfaith initiatives. He frequently spoke at Jewish events and invited rabbis to speak at Fisher. Here he is with Daryl Friedman of the Jewish Federation. You can see Father Lavery in front of a tree at the top right-hand side of this photograph. There he is right there. In June of 1971, Nixon attended a garden party at the home of Paul Miller, a member of Fisher's Board of Trustees. President Nixon and Father Lavery strike up a conversation around golf, of course. Later, Nixon sends Father Lavery a sleeve of official Nixon golf balls. I love to know where those go. <laughs> of course, as Father Lavery was out connecting with the community, he had a right-hand man who championed the faculty and students. Father Joseph Dorsey was a trusted advocate, acting as dean during most of Father Lavery's tenure. As I said, photographs tell us a lot about a person. As you can see, Father Dorsey was a rather good-natured fellow. As a pro progressive thinker in the area of higher education, the students trusted him to advocate on their behalf. The students enlisted the help of Father Dorsey and the faculty, convincing Father Lavery to relax the dress code in 1967. The Student Board of Administration surveyed the faculty with three proposals for an updated dress code. The faculty voted in favor of abandoning the coats and ties for neat and clean trousers and shirts, but absolutely no, no slippers and no t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Father Dorsey even ran for New York State Senate in 1972. He lost, unfortunately, but I certainly would have voted for him. <laughs> Um, it wasn't until 1962 that Fisher appointed its first official campus chaplain or director of campus ministries. Father Joseph Travato, who is much beloved, was our first chaplain. Enduringly known as Father Joe, he served as director from 1962 until 1987. Father Travato came to Fisher in 1959 as an assistant professor of Italian and Spanish and moderator of religious activities. As time went on, he spent less time teaching and more time as chaplain. He is the recipient of the trustees medallion of honor and recognition of his many contributions to the college. He served Fisher for 30 years before leaving in 1989 to become parish priest at Christ the King Church in Aranjacoit. You may ask, how, the, how do I know that he was much beloved? Well, no. <laughs> in a Pioneer newspaper article published on February 23, 1984, the student ad hoc Travato Canonization Committee created <laughs> Father Travato's birthday, March 1st, 1984, as Father Travato Day. They sold these pins with all the proceeds donated to Oxfam International, one of Father Travato's favorite charities. In point number three in the article above, the students declare that Father Travato's spirit dominate Fisher on March 1st that enemies shake hands and friends confirm their friendship as, as we as a community acknowledge the galvanizing power of good example. In addition, on March 30th, 1986, the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle ran a two-page two story about Father Travato mm -hmm. entitled, He's Mr. Nice Guy. 
I apologize for the poor quality of this image, but I only have this one copy made from the original when copiers and scanners were not as advanced as they are today. At any rate, the article states that Father Travato has sought to offer what he calls a ministry of presence at Fisher, being there for students and faculty alike, sharing himself and the gospel. There's a thread, I think, that goes through the whole gospel, which I probably stress, Father Travato said, and that's Christ's openness and compassion to men and women of every kind of situation, an openness to weakness, a desire to heal, to lift up the broken and a desire to share life and good times. It's no wonder Father Joe was held in such high regard. Over the years, the bazillion fathers in campus ministry have supported the spiritual and religious experiences of each person on campus, promoting religious expression, peace, justice, and a culture of service. In this photograph, we have Father Mitch Dualgo on the left, and Father Paul English on the right. Okay. <laughs> in 1983, Professor Lou Butino and Gary Mervis started a Fisher institution, the Teddy Dance for Love Dance Marathon, to raise money for Camp Good Days and Special Times Teddy Project. From the very beginning, the Bazillion Fathers were all in on this project. Father Lavery is quoted as saying, the Teddy Project represents what the Bazillions believe and love. In the mid 1980s, the Bazillions formed the Father Joe and the Confessions Air Band performed at the Teddy Band. We do not, there is video, there's evidence. The band consisted of Father Norm Tank as Bruce Springsteen, Father Philip Acaro on bass guitar, Father Joe Travado on keyboard, Father John Polokas on drums, and Father Leo Hetzler on tambourine. <laughs> As you can see in this picture, the Bazillions really got into their roles. I love Father Kara's bandana and sunglasses. <laughs> and who could possibly forget Father Joe Lanzalaka's Blessing of the Feet performed before every Teddy Dance Marathon while Director of Campus Ministries starting in, 19, in 2001. In 1968, the college became independent from the Catholic Diocese and women were first admitted in 1971. Both of these decisions were economic ones. The Bundy Law that went into effect in 1969 would restrict funding to colleges with religious affiliation. As Father Lavery maintained close relationships with political leaders, he was aware that separation from the diocese would be necessary in order to maintain state aid. The women, of course, were another source of enrollment, but Sister Helen Daniel, president at Nazareth College was none too pleased with our decision. Having <laughs> a long standing relationship between the two schools. In 1980, Father Braden took over as college president. By this time, Father Laffrey had had some health issues, he was more interested in working collaborative, collaboratively with a group of Rochester area college administrators to advocate for more government funding and support. Now that the college had separated from the college diocese, Father Braden was the very first president of St. John Fisher College that had to interview for his position. All other presidents had been appointed by St. Michael's and the Bazillion Order. Father Braden also taught physics while acting as president. <laughs> Father Braden was a very different type of president and must have been very difficult for him to be in the shadow of Father Lavery, who was now given the title of chancellor. Father Braden was more of a scholar than an administrator at heart. He taught classes even while serving as president. Here, Father Braden is seen at the groundbreaking breaking for a new dormitory or residence halls in Shays Powers Parlor. That residence hall was originally named Rochester House, but upon Father Dorsey's passing, the students insisted it be changed to Dorsey Hall. Father, Do Father Braden faced many challenges, not the least of which was enrollment. At the time, New York State was forecasting a 30 to 40% drop in college enrollment over the next 10 to 15 years. Father Braden spent much of his time trying to raise funds and also appealing to a more international audience. <laughs> 
this photograph, more than any other, speaks volumes about Father Braden's presidency. You can see both men with hands on the wheel. That must have been very difficult for him. Father Lavery would have undoubtedly been a very difficult act to follow. In 1985, Father Braden had decided to retire. This would be an end to an era for Fisher. The leadership that follows Father Braden has since been entirely made up of lay people. However, the Bazillions were represented among the faculty for a really long time. Sadly, we have lost mem many members of the order over the past few years. We're happy to have Father Kevin Manera as Director of Campus Ministries carrying forth our Bazillion tradition and delighted to have Father George Smith for a time, the William and Helen Kavanaugh Endowed Chair of Catholic Studies. We are indebted to the dedication of our Bazillion Fathers as we continue to teach goodness, discipline, and knowledge at St. John Fisher University. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. I welcome you to contact me anytime. Every day I learn more about our history through my interactions with pe people from Fisher's Tots. At this time, I welcome any questions and comments. And also here is my email address at the bottom of the screen. I'm always happy to hear from anyone who'd like to hear a story. Anyone have any questions, comments? I wonder. Yes. Is there still that tension between Nazareth and St. John Fisher? It, um, I wouldn't say tension necessarily, perhaps a bit of indifference, I don't know. Um, there isn't really tension, but there certainly isn't that cooperation that the two schools had together at the beginning of their, uh, when the, the colleges were first instituted. There's um, not as much interaction between the student bodies. I don't know why that distance has become longer <laughs> yeah, with more technology it's odd isn't it yeah because the um during orientation uh fisher and nazareth students would come together and walk to um oh what's the name of the park corvus glen. corvus glen yes absolutely that seems like such a long way to walk to me right so apparently that happened yeah when i was at school there was a great tradition and it was when freshmen would come on campus and it was called a grease pole. Oh, yes. And it wasn't, nobody got hazed, but it was uh, an aggressive approach to get a beanie on top of a grease pole. Mm -hmm. yes. And if you succeeded in no. 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 a hero. If you succeed, yes, indeed. If I did. So um, first year students were re required to retrieve the beanie that was placed on the very top of what I think was maybe a telephone pole, like in the back property. Yes. And um, the upperclassmen would, what I understand would put like used oil and grease at the bottom of the pole. That's what I hear. Uh, please correct me because I've been wrong. Um, and then it was the job the students had, the first year students had to get the beanie off the top of that grease pole before they were allowed to stop having to wear the beanie. Is that correct? Is that how it works? Sure. Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. The of the grease pole, which was greased all the way up, mm -hmm. it had uh, mounds of tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes, <laughs> even. Defense. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I have wonderful photographs of this. And we are for the 75th anniversary collecting stories that alumni have shared with us. And what I've done then is taken the stories and tried to find evidence of those things. And someone did mention the grease pole. So I've collected some photographs. So keep an eye on the website for the 75th anniversary because there will be one about orientation and the grease pole. And we'll have photos. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. You keep referring to the 75th anniversary. Is that 75th anniversary of the groundbreaking? What is it's 1948? Excuse me. Eight, I guess. Uh, yes. So the purchasing of the property. Purchase of the property. But carry out. I know. Uh, we had this debate, right? Is it the first day of school? Is mm -hmm. it the charter? Is it the groundbreaking? You know, there was debate about that. So I understand. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else? You, in one of your pictures, you know, it was late 60s, early 70s, whenever the dress code was changed, mm -hmm. there was a, uh, a secondary picture on the side and it had a fellow with a full beard, a student. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Was that part of the dress code release that they could then, we could all then <laughs> wear our beards? Yes. Wait, so I think it was the one with Father Travato. Uh, that That's the first hairy guy I saw. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get there. That one. Back up there. Yes. Yeah. 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 67. It's yeah. It was, it was loud then. Yeah. It was definitely allowed then. It was. I was 69 freshman. I had my first beard then. Okay. So. And we continue to start one through And it still grows. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was recruited out of Buffalo, and the recruiter promised those of us who went to that that Nazareth and Fisher would be merged within two years, <laughs> and that we would have a library that never materialized. Mm -hmm. Neither never happened in my time. During your time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to be cautious about promising. <laughs> well, they believed it. They believed it. Yeah. Yeah. When I came here, it was believed. Um, at that time, too, I mean, to their defense, uh, Nazareth students could come to Fisher to take classes and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've had, I, I, on one instance, I had a, a woman call mm -hmm. to say that her mother had passed away and she remembered Fisher so very fondly as a graduate of Fisher. And she wondered if I had any photographs of her that they could use. But what I discovered was she had graduated, you know, 68 or 69. I said, I'm terribly sorry, but she couldn't have been, she couldn't have graduated from Fisher, right? She must have graduated from Nazareth. But, and she apologized and said, but she spoke so fondly of Fisher. Yeah. So it was really interesting. Yeah. Well, a, a daily bus ran back and forth many times. The little blue the bus. Little blue yeah. bus. Yeah. 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 Many, many times. <laughs> Is, Jim? You know, there's many examples here of back in the 60s when the two colleges were close. And in this room alone, there's examples of fishermen married men from Nazareth and are living happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm one of them. Fabulous. You got up here, you know, Leon. Wonderful. Is there anybody else? Yeah, well, so, yeah. so only a year to take your mission from there. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this walk down memory lane is is uh, just incredible. Good friend, Father Joe, and you feel that Father Joe's legacy lives on here yeah. today. The campus ministry center bears Father Joe's name, right. and. Uh, was a just a wonderful man and a wonderful priest and a very close friend. I only had the pleasure of meeting him towards the very end a few years ago. I did have the pleasure of meeting him at a fine gentleman. Mm -hmm. He was just the same. Mm -hmm. there, I, I wanted to say uh, when you talked about the relationship between Nazareth and Fisher back in the day, okay, um, I have a dim recollection. That the biology departments of both institutions, at least for a short time, actually merged. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Okay. Yeah. So there, there's a little sorry, courses. A little factoid, I suppose, <laughs> to put in. Yeah, the, yeah. But the, I think you're yeah, right. So so you got right. some verification. Yeah. I think uh, Dr. Joan Rowan, who yeah. was yeah. professor of biology yeah. at the time. He might have been involved in that. Yeah. Thanks. You're right. Just a recollection. Thank you, Dan. So those are sorts of things I love to hear because then I can go back and find evidence and you know learn a little bit more about it. Yep. There was a loophole when I was uh, at Fisher that if uh, you wanted to take a course that Fisher didn't offer, but Nazareth did, you could go to Nazareth and take that course. That's right. So we yeah. have. Is there is there any list of all of the Brazilians who were affiliated here at one time? I'm not. 
create a comprehensive list. <laughs> but I can Nancy, in the lobby of Carney Hall, Leon, on the left side, oh, when you right. come in, all of the bazillions who have served are listed there. <laughs> There's, um, right outside the president's office. Thank you, Beth. At one more. Okay. Um, I believe it was 1966. Robert Kennedy was on campus mm -hmm. and he gave a, a speech at the, the gym, the first gym. Yeah. And uh, he was greeted. And I remember seeing him as he was leaving the building. And it was just, you know, two years later, he was assassinated. That was, that was a big memory for me. I photographs of that as well. So there's absolute evidence that that did happen. Yeah. Yes. What happened? Huh? Um, Robert Kennedy spoke here on campus in the gym. Yeah, I can just uh, you know, further into that because I was there. Met him. You know that that was quite a thrill. He was at the time it was 1964 and he was running the Senate, the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. He spoke in the middle gymnasium. Uh, and I can remember because I kind of um, prided myself at the time of doing a pretty good imitation of President Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy gets up there and he's surrounded by Father Lavery, Father Dorsey, Sheehan, and he gets up there and he goes, I'm proud that they have a read. Goes to be Dawsey or Peter Sheehan. I remember that all these many years later. <laughs> There's photographs of that as well. Jane, were you going to say something? Um, just a slight change of topic. When I look at the picture there, I'm not focused as focused on Father Travato as I am on Father Travato's dear friend. It looks like one of the Beatles <laughs> right in back of him. So Bearded. could you verify the actual identity? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to see if there's anything on the back of that photograph, but maybe, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, it was the Beatles days, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. And